So uh, today we're going to go ahead and start into uh, the alcohols. Uh, I said a moment ago there's going to be a lot of repeat from last lecture, but I think the review will probably help you guys anyway. So to see this up again. But now we're just going to be looking at it in application. So this chapter, uh, the first chapter here is all about alcohols. Is that showing up okay with the green paper? Or should I use white paper? That's brought green with me. It looks fine. All right. So uh, alcohols in particular are uh, basically carbon compounds that have an OH group on them. So COH. And I like to be uh, specific here and say that they have a particular hybridization. Um, oftentimes the carbon here is sp3 hybridized. So sp3. Uh, before we continue, can you guys over on that side of the room hear me okay? Is the mic coming through okay? Okay, I just want to make sure you guys can hear me. <clears throat> um, we, we are going to go over these compounds quite a bit this semester, but if they have a double bond with an OH, uh, that's technically sp2 hybridized. And you guys remember what these are called? I think I mentioned it to, to you guys briefly, maybe. Yep, they are an enol. Uh, the reason why we don't really think of these as an alcohol is because they will be in equilibrium with the corresponding aldehyde. And I believe we just hit last time with the, uh, that re reaction with the addition to alkynes, we saw this. So basically we say that these are not an alcohol. So not an alcohol. All right, uh, the, there is one exception to this though. Um, it turns out that we, we do consider phenols as an alcohol. And the reason why is because uh, we, we don't consider enols an alcohol because they actually dominate in the carbonyl form. Um, but it turns out that phenols actually dominate in the uh, enol form. And we'll, we'll, we'll see the uh, reasons why when we get to the aromatic chapter. But a phenol is considered an alcohol. All right, so uh, what I have planned here for today is uh, we're going to go over the, uh, quickly go over the nomenclature. Uh, I'm also going to do uh, ethers as well with, with alcohol. So we can say alcohols and ethers for this section. Uh, nomenclature, physical properties, uh, how to make them, and reactions of them. And as I said to you guys last time, that's pretty much what the whole semester is. It's one functional group at a time. So we got to bear with me, guys, here. There's a lot of reactions we have to go through. Uh, thankfully for this chapter, there's a lot of review in this chapter, so it's a nice warm-up for the semester. All right, so nomenclature. Uh, so basically what you want to do is uh, use an OL ending, uh, meaning that you want to name it as part of the parent. So part of of the parent. Uh, the main, the main ex uh, exception to when you use an OL ending is if there is a, an oxygen group that has a higher priority. So pretty much every other oxygen containing functional group is a higher priority than alcohols are. So uh, in that case, use hydroxy. And I will show you examples of when we use hydroxy, when we use the OL ending. So for example, we have this, and you guys should probably know the name of this one, right? That's ethanol. Ethanol. Uh, for this particular alcohol, you don't have to denote the number of the carbon it's on because it can only be on the carbon one. Uh, if you were to say two ethanol, it still is technically one ethanol. So there is no real correct way to do that, or that, that is the correct way to do this. Um, however, when you start getting more carbon uh, on there, you have to denote the number. So for example, this is 2-propanol. Uh, do you guys remember the al uh, alternate way to uh, use the numbers? Yep, you, pl you, can, you can plug it into the word right before the OL. So uh, that way is technically the, the more correct way now. And I, I did want to mention here that 
Uh, this is the old-fashioned way for the IUPAC. Uh, this is the more modern way. They're both technically correct. Um, however, when you guys go take your standardized tests and whatnot, uh, they're going to have a tendency to use the lower way here, if you guys haven't, uh, if you haven't seen it that way yet. And then we have a common name. Uh, the common name, uh, the way you name, to name alcohol, is you say uh, alkyl, like whatever the alkyl piece is, and then the word alcohol. So this, would, uh, this one here is ethyl alcohol. This is the common name. And then this one is isopropyl alcohol. And you guys all know the, this is the alcohol people like to drink. And then the common name for this one is, what is that one? That's rubbing alcohol. So uh, see what you guys think. Uh, so typically when you, when you clean electronics, uh, a good way to clean ele electronics is to uh, get 90 percent 90, 90 plus uh, isopropyl alcohol and, you, and put on a Q-tip and like wipe off uh, electronics with it. Uh, why do you think it's better to use the ninety percent isopropyl alcohol versus like the fifty percent? Water. So uh, what? It, so basically, the rubbing alcohol will evaporate quicker. So just a little uh, real-world application of this: if you're ever cleaning electronics and you want to buy rubbing alcohol, you want to buy the one that's mostly isopropyl, so ninety percent plus. Otherwise, you risk ruining whatever piece of electronic you're trying to clean. So I'm thinking like like the little outlets on your phone and whatnot. If you get the little junk out of there, you can use it, you can use rubbing alcohol to get it out. But water will ruin the electronics. All right. So uh, here is an example of uh, a case where we have a higher priority group. Um, I know we haven't gone over carboxylic acids yet, uh, but essentially what you do is you name it as the parent and it's oic acid at the end. So uh, this would be a butanoic acid, because it's four carbons. So butanoic acid. Uh, you wouldn't name it as an alcohol because the carboxylic acid is higher priority. So uh, what do you guys think we should have as the prefix on this word? So keep in mind, it's, it's, uh, alcohol in this case is the lower priority. So the carbon two or carbon three? This is carbon one. So it goes one, two, three. And then that's three hydroxy, but I, I can also put stereochemistry on this too because it is a chiral center. Yeah, that is a three R hydroxy. Three R hydroxy. Yep, R and S is back. It's not going away. And let me, let me pause this. And Are there any questions on this one? Okay, uh, for naming ethers, uh, there's, there's two ways to name ethers. We have you know, the IUPAC way, and then we also have the common way. We're going to go ahead and go over both. So the IUPAC way for ether nomenclature is to uh, use an alkoxy prefix. So alkoxy prefix. Uh, the one trick you want to think about uh, with, with ethers, remember these are the compounds that have a carbon, oxygen, carbon. Uh, if you have a situ usually have a situation where one carbon branch is longer than the other, you want to choose the shorter branch to name as the alkoxy group. And then the other part is the parent. <clears throat> so let's just go ahead and do an example, and I'll give you guys the uh, common names, the IUPAC names for both. So for this one, uh, we have a choice of, okay, are we going to name it as a methoxy or an ethoxy? It's going to be a methoxy because the methyl group is shorter. You want to name the smaller carbon piece as the substituent. So this portion here is a methoxy, and then this we have ethane. So this is methoxy ethane, all one word. And then the other uh, example I have for you guys was, let's put some more chiral centers on there. Here, let's do a fun one. All right. 
So what is the parent, do you guys think? Is it a pent or a hex butte? Yeah, so uh, we have a choice. So we have this side here, it has a four carbon chain. This has a three carbon chain. So this part is the parent. And then this part is the substituent. So the parent is a butanol. So butan, uh, what carbon do you guys think it's at? The OH group, the carbon two. So for uh, numbering from lowest numbers here, you want to number it from this direction. So let me go ahead and put the numbers in. Just so we're clear on what's going on here. So it goes one, two, three, four. Uh, once again, we are making sure that we have the lower uh, numbers. And that, is that a 2R or a 2S? That is an S. Yep. That is a 2S O. All right. So uh, just, uh, just so we're clear on uh, what's happening here with the chirality, the top priority group, remember we go by first point of difference, so one atom out. So one atom down this way, this way, this way. So we have oxygen versus carbons. <coughs> oxygen has the higher, higher atomic number. That is priority. Uh, second priority, we go one, one atom out here. CH2, CH2, they're the same. Next atom out, we have a point of difference. So this is a priority two, that's priority three. So once again, it goes one, two, three, counterclockwise, it's S. All right, what do you guys think we should name the substituent? Yep, that's two propoxy. So uh, this is a situation where we have a branch on a branch. We didn't see much of that last semester. Um, but here uh, we have to denote that if that carbon one on the parent, and then if you have a branch on a branch, typically what we'll do is put a two propoxy. And the reason why I'm doing it this way is I'm, I'm, I'm indicating that this is where uh, it's attached to the rest of the carbon chain, is that carbon number two. Okay, uh, to name the, comp the common name, it's literally alkyl, alkyl ether. So you, you, you basically think of the two halves, the two alkyl sides in the ether, you name them both and just say the, just say the word ether. Similar to how we do with the alcohol, then you just name the alkyl piece and just say the word alcohol. So uh, this one here would be, so you think it would be methyl ethyl ether or ethyl methyl? Is it methyl ethyl or ethyl methyl, do you think? So you probably should go alphabetical order, just like we did with the naming before. So it's a ethyl methyl. So ethyl methyl ether. You put a little line between these two. And then this one here, I would say it is a... This one does not lend itself well to common names because of the fact that we have a complex branch here. Yeah, so I wouldn't even bother naming it this way with the common name, but that is an isopropyl group on there. Yeah, typically we only use the common name with simple ethers. Uh, let's go ahead and just do two more real quick that, uh, because they have more real world applications to them. Uh, we have this uh, ether and then we have this one so we've actually seen this one in lab. Uh, naming it by IUPAC, it is ethoxyethane. And what would the common name be, you think? Yep, it's diethyl ether. And what was the uh, other common name for that compound? <coughs> if, you, if you just say the word ether, you are implying diethyl ether. Yep, yep. Yeah. So if you're if you if someone says the word ether as a solvent, they are referring to specifically diethyl ether. <coughs> and this one here, we look at the shorter carbon piece. This is a methoxy. 
And then, uh, what do you guys think the parent is? So I, I want to go by IUPAC first. So uh, IUPAC here, we got to na name the longest carbon chain, which is three carbons. So it's a uh, propyl, so propane. So we have uh, <clears throat> two methoxy, two methyl propane. And what do you think the common name for that one is? It's a methyl terpbutyl. Yep, that, that's when you want to use the terpbutyl for the common names here. Yep, so methyl terpbutyl ether. Uh, this one is actually uh, commonly given an acronym of MTBE, methyl terpbutyl ether. Uh, both this compound and ethanol are, are commonly used as uh, fuel additives for gasoline. So when you burn gasoline, you want to make sure that you're getting a full combustion of gasoline. Uh, if, you have, if you have a situation where your gasoline is oxygen starved, which can happen if you have a bad uh, catalytic converter, um, it'll lead to uh, incomplete combustion products such as uh, you'll have hydrocarbons coming out of your fuel tank. You could also have uh, carbon monoxide or just elemental carbon coming out. So to prevent that, uh, the industry, they will add oxygen containing compounds in there. Um, MTBE was very commonly used for a long time as uh, the oxygen source. Uh, now, uh, more commonly, ethanol is used. So when you guys go to the fuel pump, you may see on the pump it says make 10% ethanol. Uh, that's because they want to make sure that you have enough oxygen in there to get a full com conversion to CO2 when you burn your uh, hydrocarbons in your, in your fuel tank. So a little bit of real-world application there for you guys. Uh, Another thing about this stuff here is uh, the reason why they stopped using it is actually, uh, apparently it's better uh, than ethanol is, but they stopped using it because they were finding that in certain areas it was uh, seeping through the ground and getting into the groundwater. And this, this stuff is pretty toxic to humans. So to avoid this getting into our water supply that goes through our homes, uh, they took it out. Now they have ethanol instead in there. Like, hey, if they're going to drink ethanol, we can just put it in the water. So. <laughs> All right, so uh, we got the nomenclature out of the way. That's pretty much all I'm going to spend on the nomenclature. Um, if, you're, if you have a hard time with nomenclature, just make sure you guys spend some time to practice. It shouldn't be too bad. Um, for those of you guys that did not have me last semester, uh, you, uh, the way I do nomenclature on the test is I don't actually straight up ask nomenclature questions. I build them into other questions. So for example, if I asked you to predict the product, I may give all the choices as names. So you have to be able to like draw it out and then get the name for, uh, from that. So I, I typically don't ask this uh, nomenclature question, but I make them compound questions as a way to get more, more bang for the buck, I guess. All right, so let's take a look at some physical properties of both ethers and alcohols. So physical properties. So let's go ahead and take a look at, I think let's do alcohols first. All right, so uh, one of the big notable features for alcohol that's important to us is that uh, oftentimes alcohols will have higher boiling points and melting points than other compounds with equivalent molecular weight. I'll write this down. So alcohols have a higher melting point and boiling point than alkanes with a similar molecular weight. All right, so a little bit of review from last semester. Uh, one of the main things that are, two of the main things that affect melting points and boiling points, uh, the first one is molecular weights. The heavier something is, the higher the melting points and boiling points are. And what was the other thing that affects these? Intramolecular forces, yes. So uh, why do you think alcohols have a higher melting point and boiling point than corresponding alkanes? H-bonding, yes. That's one of the stronger intramolecular forces. 
And once again here, this is due to H bonding. All right. So let's go ahead and draw the H bond. So here I'm going to draw out just your ethanol here. Uh, we could show it interacting with another ethanol molecule. Like that. And the interaction is, is there. This is a special case of a dipole moment. Uh, this bond does have a dipole. And essentially what's happening is the ones that have the opposite polarity are interacting. Like this. It's a very significant intermolecular force. It has a, a profound effect on the melting points and boiling points of alcohols. All right, uh, I think the only other physical property I wanted to talk about for now was that uh, their miscibility with water. So if they're soluble in water or not. So alcohols will mix with water. You guys remember this one, How, uh, the, the, the restriction? Well, there was, like a, there was a condition I gave you guys last semester about uh, like how many carbons per OH for it to be water soluble. Would it, be like two carbons? it was three carbons per OH. Oh. So uh, in order for an alcohol to be miscible with water, there is, must be less than or equal to three carbons per OH. So, so alcohols mix with H2O. If there are less than or equal to three carbons per OH. So the kind of question I could ask uh, from this material here would be if I gave you an alcohol and you could be able to tell me whether or not it was soluble in water or not. So do you think that alcohol is soluble in water? So we, we can count our carbons here. We have what, one, two, three, four, five carbons. It's a C5, so we have less than three Cs per OH. This would be water soluble. So we say soluble. And then this particular alcohol, you guys think? Nope, that's insoluble. So once again, what you're going to what you do here is you just count the number of carbons and then just divide that by the number number of OHs, and that and if that number is, is three or less, it'll uh, be soluble in water. Uh, keep in mind that solubility in general is really a gray scale. But this is a good cutoff point: is the three carbons per OH. Um, if you were to mix, say, butanol in the water, some of it will go into the water, but most of it probably won't. But it's all equilibria; it's all gray scale. All right, um, before we move on, I, I did want to go over ether physical properties. So uh, let's go look at ethers here. Um, it turns out that ethers actually have a similar boiling point as alkanes with a similar molecular weight. Do you have a question, James? No. Okay. All right, uh, so ethers have similar melting points and boiling points as similar molecular weight alkanes. And that's because they have, they do have, technically have a dipole moment, but they have a pretty weak intermolecular forces. So once again here, the reason why is they have weak intermolecular forces. So in general, uh, ethers tend to be very volatile, meaning they have a low boiling point, they have a high vapor pressure. So you should probably work in a fume hood if you work with ethers. Um, diethyl ether in particular should work in a fume hood because it, it can uh, knock you out, literally. All right, uh, so I, I do have a comparison here. So I have a diethyl ether has uh, the corresponding alkane you would compare it to. But, so you, may, you might think you might want to compare it with, uh, so diethyl ether has four carbons. 
And you would think you might compare it to butane, but you don't. You compare it by molecular weights. So <laughs> instead of comparing it to, to butane, it makes more sense to compare it to pentane. And it works out that uh, diethyl ether has a boiling point of uh, 74. Wait, this is not right. That's not right. These are both about 36. Well, they, I, I have uh, the boiling for diethyl ether to be 74 degrees uh, Celsius. I think that's supposed to be Fahrenheit. Because yeah, uh, you can actually get ether to boil if you just cup it in your hand and hold it really tightly. Your body temperature can boil it. So yeah, 74 does not sound right. 36 sounds better. All right, uh, also in general, ethers do not mix with water. So ethers do not mix with H2O. Uh, for the same thing here, they have, weak, uh, they have different intermolecular forces. Remember, uh, like dissolves like, so uh, water have, is mostly polar, where ethers are essentially nonpolar. All right, another thing of, of interest here that I have mentioned is uh, ethers can form hydroperoxides. So ethers can form, and these are hydroperoxides. And this happens via auto oxidation. So if you have an ether container that is open to the air in the room, it, they will auto oxidize and to make a hydroperoxide which looks like this. That is a hydroperoxide. Uh, this can be problematic because these things will actually explode. Uh, they are a, a shock explosive, meaning if, if you were to, to, to smack the bottle real quick to have the stuff in it, the bottle would explode. Uh, pretty dangerous. I think I mentioned the last time there's a reason why we store ether in metal bottles with plastic lids. It's because uh, if any of this stuff forms, and that, that, remember that ether container we had last semester in the lab, it was a, like an aluminum container with a plastic lid. Uh, typically, these, will, uh, these compounds will form in the threads of, of the bottle. And if you had a metal on metal container, it, would, it might spark when you turned it. And so you have an explosive at the cap and you have a, a fuel at the bottom. You basically have a bomb in your hand. So to avoid that, they simply just put the plastic on top. And we don't want to store them in uh, plastic containers because these organic solvents will eventually etch their way through plastics. And the, the bottle will disintegrate faster than aluminum. All right. So any questions about the physical properties? Yay, now the fun begins. Reactions, of course, the best part. All right, so we're not quite at the reaction of alcohols. First things first, we have to talk about the synthesis of alcohols. So synthesis of alcohols. And remember, at any point you guys have questions, you're always welcome to stop me and say, I don't get this, what's going on, and ask a question. You need me to clarify something, etc. Okay, so uh, one of the, uh, a lot of these things I have in here are pretty much all from last semester. So we're actually reviewing from Tuesday. <laughs> we just went over the stuff on Tuesday. So I, I, want to, I want to make sure you guys are really good at this stuff. It's pretty important. The first reaction is hydration of alkenes. And there are uh, two different ways to do this. Well, let's just say this one is uh, H3O plus. And we will get this here. Another way you might see H3O plus written, uh, it may be written as HClAQ, HBRAQ, etc. 
Remember that means that they're aqueous, they're in water. And if these things are in water, it's implied that they are H3O plus. Okay, I do have a few comments here. Works best with dilute acids. And the problem with, do you guys remember what the problem was with using concentrated acids? We talked about it last time. You might get a different addition product, like an alkyl halide, for example. Or if you have sulfuric acid, you might get a sulfonic acid instead. So uh, concentrated acids may give other products. So may give other addition products. All right. So for practice, let's go ahead and do the mechanism. I don't think we did it last time anyway. I think we were doing some of the other ones. I think we did uh, the substitution stuff last time. So let's go ahead and take a look at this one. And I'm just choosing a generic uh, asymmetric al alkene so we can go ahead and see where the H goes. So here I'm drawing out my hydronium ion, like so. So uh, first step here, what, what do I do first? So you're saying that the nucleophile is the alkene double bond, yes. Is it a nucleophile or is it acting at the base here? Yep, acting at the base. But yeah, also nucleophiles here. All right, so in this point, you need to have a choice of where the H goes. So if the H goes here, the plus charge goes to the other carbon. And then vice versa, if the H goes here, the plus goes on the other one. You want to choose the one that gives you the more substituted uh, carbocation, right? Like that. And what was that rule again? How do we know where the plus charge goes? That was Markovnikov's rule, yes. Markovnikov's rule proceeds such that you have the more stable carbocation intermediate. All right, so. First step here is called uh, protonation. This is the protonation step. And here we are going to follow Markovnikov's rule. That was where we get the most substituted carbocation. Uh, because this is following Markovnikov's rule, we say that this reaction is regioselective. Okay. Another way you can think about it, uh, if you're having a hard time with Markovnikov's rule, I'm hoping not by now, uh, but basically what you do to get the correct carbocation is you put the H on the carbon that already has more H's on it. And you'll always end up with a more substituted carbocation if you do that. So here, uh, this carbon has two. So if you put the next one on there, you're going to get the more substituted carbocation. Where if you do it backwards, you get the less substituted. All right, so uh, notice here now we have a carbocation. Water can then come in this. So at the, at, after you get the formation of the carbocation, the rest of it is basically SN1 at this point. So we just go ahead and carbo or nucleophilic attack. So this step here is a nucleophilic attack. And then Get this, Rudolph, right? <laughs> and then uh, the, the last step here was a deprotonation. So you, you never stop at this one. You don't, you don't stop at the protonated alcohol. You want it to be a neutral alcohol. So deprotonate. All right, so once again, this step here is a deprotonation. Oop. Oop, yep, you're right. So as Alex was just saying here, um, if, if you ever have a mechanism that has the use of a catalyst, 
I will be looking for you showing it coming back in the, in the mechanism. So we use the uh, hydronium, you make the hydronium back. It serves the role of a catalyst. Water would be, technically be a reagent. All right, uh, last comment here. Because we have the similarities with SN1, uh, because we have a carbocation, if this were a chiral center, you have racemic products. So a carbocation mechanism leads to racemic products. So just like SN1. The only thing different is how it starts out. But after the carbocation forms, the rest is identical. Okay. So in this particular example, we use H3O plus. Uh, we're going to have a carbocation product here, so I, I want to go ahead and predict both products without doing a mechanism. Uh, we did a mechanism just like this last class, or similar to it, at least when it comes to the carbocation. So we have this uh, particular product and that product. Which one would you expect to be the major product? The left one or right one? The right product, yes. So we can go ahead and say this one is major, and this one is minor or trace amount. Um, if I tell you to predict the product, I'm specifically looking for the major product in, in most cases. Uh, there will be times where I ask you to predict all products, and I will specify all by putting it in all caps and underlining it to, to specify that I want to see the minor products too. I don't do that all too often. Sometimes there might be one question on the exam, but more often than not, I'm looking for the major products. Uh, once again, the reason why this happens is because of, is it a hydride shift or, or a methyl shift here? Yeah. It was a hydride shift here. So hydride shift. All right. All right, so uh, we also talked about uh, in the case where you, uh, you want to avoid rearrangements, uh, that was the oxymercuration demercuration reaction. So if you had the same compound here and we did the oxymercuration demercuration, um, I want to go ahead and do it stepwise here. So here we have one was HGOAC2, and then this was THF and H2O. So we get this product. Uh, we did cover the mechanism last semester. If you guys want, if you're curious about the mechanism, uh, the short version of it is that you had a mercury bridge carbocation that did not rearrange. Uh, and then after the reaction completed, you ended up with uh, this mercury piece on here that you had to get rid of. And that's what the second step was for. So your second step was a NABH4, and it just clips that piece off and leaves you with the alcohol here with no rearrangements. So no rearrangements, like so. All right, uh, additionally, ju uh, just so we're, uh, we're clear on all of this, and we are talking about ethers in this section too, um, if you change the water to an alcohol solvent, you will get an ether as your product instead. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's go ahead and uh, show both uh, pieces here. So THF, and then now I'm going to use the alcohol. I'm just going to arbitrarily choose methanol for this. You're going to get a similar product here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Instead of the OH, we're going to have an OCH3. And then we have the HGOAC portion here. And then your reduction step, step two, NABH4 gives us an ether product.
like so. So now we have options on making ethers. A couple options. All right. Any questions about this? I'm hoping I'm dusting off those dusting off those cobwebs that you had you developed over the break. Remember this stuff now. All right. So the next uh, reaction I have here. Let's go ahead and take uh, this alkene, and we'll take a look at the hydroboration oxidation. So the hydroboration oxidation reaction was, we can go ahead and use BH3. And I do want to mention here that we need three mole equivalents, one for every BH bond. Uh, there were some alternatives to this uh, reagent. You may see it written as B2H6. And you also may see it written as 9BBN. That's actually the modern way that this reaction is done now, is the compound 9BBN. I do not know offhand what that stands for. That is the, the modern reagent for it. All right, uh, we then get an intermediate, this trialkyl borane intermediate. It's like that. And then what was my second step here again? to get to the alcohol. So it's hydroboration, oxidation, sodium hydroxide, and, yep, hydrogen peroxide, sodium hydroxide. So H2O2 and NaOH, that is an oxidation step. And essentially what it does, so uh, going back here a second, uh, if you actually look at the transition states of these compounds, uh, you'll see that it ends up being more stable for the boron to go less substituted. And then the, the oxidation step just trades out the boron for an OH. So we're gonna get three moles of this three carbon alcohol that's less substituted, Markovnikov addition. All right, so, uh, Recall that this is a syn addition reaction. Uh, there's a couple times that comes into play, uh, most notably if there's chiral centers involved, and then if the compound's flat. Or, sorry, if it's a ring. If it's a ring here, uh, it's really apparent what happens. So BH3, 2 was NaOH, H2O2. So the way I like to predict products here is I like to uh, go ahead and plug in the new groups and then plug in the rest, the rest of the part that's missing. So in order to show that it, it is a syn addition, I want the H and the OH pointing in the same direction. So I can do that by putting the two wedges on there. <coughs> and then the OH needs to go less substituted and then that means the methyl is here and it's going back. So the thing is though, when you see your answer, your choices, uh, uh, more often than not, they're not gonna have this H drawn in. You're just gonna see a methyl and an OH pointing in opposite directions and that's the correct answer. But you're, you're supposed to just know that the H and the OH are pointing in the same direction. And then the other product is what? Yep, enantiomer. Because this molecule is flat, when the BH came in initially, it could have attacked either face, and you could have had a, a situation where they're both pointing downward, and then the methyl would be coming towards us. So long story short, plus an antimer. All right. Can I have any questions, or just keep rolling with it? Keep rolling with it, all right. So the next thing I have here is uh, reactions of alcohols. So yay, finally reactions. More, or even more reactions. We still haven't got to a new one yet though, so we're still doing 241 review, aren't we? 
even though we're technically in the 242 chapter. So next portion here is reactions of alcohols. Uh, we've seen a lot of these already. Um, so the main thing that you're going to see with alcohols is the oxygen atom can act as a nucleophile or a base. So the oxygen can act as a nucleophile or base. Another thing we're going to see too is that uh, alcohols, your ROH compounds, are weak acids. And the pKa for these is about 15. Uh, the last little note I have for you before we start getting into more specifics is that OH is a poor leaving group. And if you're, uh, it's, uh, in a lot of the reactions it undergoes, it'll be converted to a better leaving group first. So uh, once again here, uh, OH is a poor leaving group. However, it is easily converted to a good one. So easily converted to a good leaving group. Okay. So the examples I have here are, uh, suppose we were given a, a synthesis problem here and you're being uh, tasked with converting an OH group to an amine group. So we don't know what the goes in the arrow here, but we do know that we want to get the thing to an amine. So uh, did we cover a reaction yet where we can do, the, do that in one step? Like, could we just throw in any NH2 and this will work? So uh, I, I do want to actually draw this out and explain to you why it doesn't work. So we have this, these two compounds. You might be thinking, okay, we can have it, have it undergo SN2. Uh, the thing is, though, that we have a strong base here and we have a weak acid. So what's going to happen instead is an acid-base reaction. So the products are going to be an alkoxide. That is an alkoxide, like how hydroxide is an OH. If you have a carbon with an O minus, it's an alkoxide. Uh, what would the other product be? Ammonia. Ammonia. Yep. NH3. The way, uh, if you're being asked to predict equilibria, the way we do this is you look at the pKa of the acid on each side. So the acid on this side is. In alcohol, this has a pKa of about 15. And then it works out that amines have pKa's at about 35. So it's definitely going to favor this side. No substitution happening here. So instead, what you want to do is convert the OH to a better leaving group first, then do the reaction with the, ammon with the sodium amide. So uh, any ideas on how I can convert that to a good leaving group? Uh, I don't think HCO is going to do anything with this. Hmm? So what are good leaving groups that we uh, can convert it to? Like, do we know how to convert to halogens? PBR3, yes. Um, HBR will work here also. We haven't covered that yet. So, But HBR, HBR would work here. Um, so PBR3, all right, and then you do the reaction with the NaNH2. You have a primary alkyl halide here. This is more likely to substitute. Um, I do want to mention here, we'll, we'll, go, we'll talk about this more when we go over the, al the amine chapter, um, but an alternative to this would be to just use ammonia for this reaction, the second reaction. Uh, the downside of that is if you have a primary amine product, it, it has a tendency to, uh, to become mul uh, multiple alkylations on the amine. 
So this is actually a better, uh, a better reagent to use to stop at the primary amines. But we'll go into more detail about amine chemistry when we get to there at the end of the semester. All right, let's go ahead and start. The last time we talked about there was a, what, PBR3, SOCl2, where a couple different ways we can convert to good leaving groups. And I want to make sure, yeah, we'll go to that next. So this next section is all about converting OH groups. So we talked about uh, two of them already. So let's go ahead and uh, see these examples. Uh, the first case we just used in the last problem was PBR3. That's going to give you the bromine. And then the other one was SOCl2. And this will give you the chlorine. And the uh, next one here that we didn't talk about yet was H3O plus under reflux. And uh, we didn't go over what reflux is. We will see it in lab this semester. But what refluxing means is that you're heating it at boiling. So imagine you have a, a, a distillation apparatus. So you have a round bottom flask and you have a condenser on top here and you basically just have that open. So you, if, you're, if you're cooling this portion off, the vaporizing liquid doesn't have anywhere to go. It's, 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 it's going to hit the, the cold walls and just fall back in. So you're boiling the liquid, but it's constantly, the vapors are constantly falling back into the flask. And that's heating at reflux. So it's a heating at boiling. And we will use a condenser with water going into it that will uh, collect the vapor. So uh, a common question I get in lab with refluxing is, uh, do I have to put water on the condenser? Yes, you do. Because if you don't put water on it, you're just boiling then. Because you, you have to have something cold to actually collect the vapor. Uh, sometimes it works. Like if you're, if you're refluxing water, it's usually okay. But anything that's like an organic solvent, you're probably best just cooling it off. And just in, in general, I just default to putting a hose on there even if it doesn't actually need one, just to be safe about it. All right. I do want to uh, sh uh, talk about this reaction here, because that is a new one. And uh, the common one used here is HBr aqueous, is the common one. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, two different situations here. So we can go ahead and say this one and this one. And we'll have them undergo the same reaction. And we're going to see that because of the substitution on the alcohol, they're going to have different mechanisms. OK. So if we are in H, uh, HBr and water, we, we're going to have hydronium as the acid here, and not HBr, because HBr will first react with water to make hydronium, and then hydronium acts as our catalyst. Okay, so protonate, and I'm going to shorthand down on this one, we're saying H plus for short, that is technically H3O plus. All right. So doing two mechanisms at once here. So now what we can do is the, the bromine is going to trade out for our leaving group here. So right now we have a poor leaving group at the hydroxide. If you protonate it first, we have a good leaving group. So in both cases here, we now have a good leaving group in the form of water. So uh, one of them is probably going to have uh, this lose OH by SN2, and the other one will be by, by SN1. So because this one is primary, it is likely to undergo an SN2. So here's where the bromide ion comes in, does your backside attack, knocks out the leaving group. And 
And the little comment I want to add over here is this mechanism is only SN2 if it is primary. If the alcohol is a different alcohol, it'll be uh, SN1. So only SN2 with primary alcohols. The rest are going to be SN1. So in this case, after you have the protonated alcohol, you show it leave on its own. You get yourself a carbocation. And then now this is where the bromine attaches. So bromide ion attacks the carbocation. Like that. And you have all your same considerations of stereochemistry here with carbocations, all that jazz. All right. <laughs> I think I have uh, one more set of reactions here to go through. It'll be fun. All right, so uh, we saw earlier today that uh, the uh, acidity of an OH can be problematic for certain reactions. So uh, another thing we can do besides doing these reactions is we can do what's called der derivatization. Uh, this is actually very commonly used, actually more so than these are. So we're going to get to some more real-world chemistry here. So uh, this next part is referred to as derivatization of ROH. Okay. So it turns out that uh, alcohols are uh, can be easily converted to aprotic compounds. <coughs> So ROH can be converted to aprotic compounds, with good leaving groups. Another thing we like to talk about with these uh, derivatizations is that, come on, let me just dim it a little. Uh, they can also be called a protecting group. So, or protecting group. So we're we're gonna see we're gonna see it in, in synthesis problems, uh, probably next week. When you have these acidic H's in there, they can be problematic. But you don't want to just change out that OH group. You can protect it and just block it basically. So it won't it won't act as an alcohol. Uh, it'll be ignored by a, a reagent later in the reaction. And then we can easily convert it back to an alcohol just by treating it with water. So uh, the main three groups here are uh, a mesyl group. So you, can, you convert it to uh, this. So instead of having an H on there, we'll have this group on there. This is a mesyl group. So M-E-S-Y-L, or just M-S, you might see it written as. The other one is if we have the benzene with the toluene on there, that's called a tosyl group, T-O-S-L, sorry, T-O-S-Y-L, tosyl, or T-S for short. And the other one is a trifle group. So once again, the sulfur groups here. So question, why do you think these would make for really good leaving groups? We had, basically you're gonna have an O minus on there if it's a leaving group on all the, uh, why, do they, why do they make good leaving groups? Not necessarily that they're bulky. Resonant stabilized. Yep, they are very weak bases. They are resonant stabilized. So they will make excellent leaving groups. Also, because we have this piece on there instead of an H, that oxygen group is no longer acidic. And these are really easy to use to, to convert. You use the corresponding chloride compound to make it. So use corresponding chloro compound. So for example, if I wanted to convert this OH here, 
Uh, I'll basically take tosyl chloride as TSCl. Oops, sorry. Yep, tosyl chloride, TSCl, and it'll put OTS on there. That is an excellent leaving group. It's also no longer acidic. All right. Question, Pauline? Compound. Okay. Yeah, compound. <laughs> All right. Okay, so there are some interesting things about this here. Uh, this leaving group is resonance stabilized. So resonance stabilized leaving group. There are no acidic H's. So another question I have for you guys is, uh, so looking at this reaction here, uh, which uh, side of the reaction do you expect to be more volatile? Do you think the, the reactant was more volatile or, so basically, am I ask, I'm asking here, is it, did you make the compound less volatile or more volatile, do you think? It's actually uh, more volatile because there are no H bonding now. So there's no H bonding. What happens to the melting point and boiling points? They go down. That makes them more volatile. You have more vapor pressure. So here, uh, there's no H bonding. And as a result, they are more volatile, meaning they have a lower boiling point. Uh, the reason why this is interesting is because I suppose you were looking at GC data. So you remember GC data from last semester? Uh, typically an alcohol will look like this on the GC. It broadens a little bit. You guys probably saw the, the kind of broaden OH peaks a little bit on the GC lab. It turns out that if you derivatize them, they sharpen up quite a bit like that. So it allows them to, uh, to be easier to see. And honestly, uh, that's probably the most prominent use for derivatization is for GC analysis. Uh, this has really uh, uh, significant uses. Uh, the most significant one I can think of uh, off the top of my head is for drug testing. So uh, if you were to get drug test and the person drug testing you was using a, a, a GCMS to do the drug testing with, uh, oftentimes what they'll do is they will uh, They'll extract your urine with an organic solvent and then treat it with a derivatization agent and then inject that into the GC. And what it allows them to do is that it'll, it'll sharpen these peaks up and it makes some things easier to see on, on the GC data. Uh, we were actually recently doing this kind of work here at CSN the, the last few summers. Uh, we had a project where we were going out to the, uh, the wastewater dump out in Henderson, or it's close to Henderson, and we were collecting water samples and we were uh, looking for different uh, drugs in the water. And we were doing this the weekend after EDC. So we, we're, we, we found a few things in the water. So at the, yeah, they, they actually found a, a lot of methamphetamines, uh, marijuana, and ecstasy in the water. And we did this analysis by treating the water, or first we would, would treat the water with the organic solvent, and then we would do the, the derivatization on it. If you did not do the derivatization on it, it's hard to see the peaks because there's a lot of stuff in there. And if their peaks are broadened and flat, things are harder to see. So we commonly do this to make things stand out a little bit better. All right. Any questions, comments, concerns about today's lecture? I think it was a good stopping point. Uh, next time, if you, if you guys do want to read ahead, I'm going to be opening tomorrow's lecture, sorry, Tuesday's lecture on uh, how, to, how to make ethers and in, uh, specifically the Williamson ether synthesis. Um, I do believe I covered that last semester with you guys, but for those who didn't have any last semester, make sure you guys read up on it. That was where we made an alkyl, uh, alkyl halide and then alkoxide and then brought them together with FN2. So it, it, it was an application of FN2. All right.